everybody and welcome. My name is Micah Babel. I'm a former top 30 WTA pro and today we're going to talk about the one-handed backhand and especially about the contact point and how you get to repeat the proper contact point over and over and over. So I had a one-hander pretty rare even back then. I competed from 1991 to 2000, even uh, less popular today. But let's get going right here. So the first thing that we have to start with is the grip. The grip should be an Eastern backhand grip. And the way that you find it is you go and just take your hitting hand. I'm a right hander. The underside of your index finger knuckle and the middle of the heel pad, if you between those two points draw a line, that line should be on top of your bevel here on the top bevel. So going a little closer to you, I'm having my knuckle right on top here and my heel pad covers that top bevel. So that is my Eastern backhand grip. Um, you do see players now inching over a little bit more. I can remember uh, Justine Anna being that far over, but most everybody hits an Eastern backhand grip. So for a left-hander, of course, it's the other way around, index finger knuckle and heel pad, and it should look something like this here because that allows you to really make contact, and we'll go over that in detail, out in front, and there's no strain on your wrist. That to me is the most important thing. If you have the wrong grip and you force yourself to hit balls in any of these fashions, you're most likely gonna put a lot of strain on your wrist. So let's get through the components of a one-handed backhand and then I'll throw you into different scenarios and I'll also show you some drills that I used to do when I played on tour. So number one thing we already talked about is the grip. Number two is your ready position. So your ready position should be Eastern backhand grip and left hand on the throat of the racket because the left arm actually plays a very active role in your one-hander. So you're in your ready position, kind of belly button high and the first thing, of course, as your opponent makes contact is your split step. Okay, from there on out, left arm helps with your unit turn. And you see that I haven't moved yet. And there are different ways to hit your backhand with different stances. The upper body, however, is working the same way every single time. So again, got my split step, I'm turning here, and I wanna be as far around so that my chin almost touches my shoulder. And you see on my take back here, I'll do it from the side. The racket face is above my wrist and my hand stays between hip and shoulder. So I'm not up here, I'm not down here. So that allows me to have a pretty good loop. I'm coming back here. And now I'm getting to my ball. If I'm just hitting a regular closed stance, let's say that's what I'm doing because I'm not having to move a whole lot. I'm stepping in here and both arms are still coming down. They're still both on the racket, especially the left. And when I'm about close to my left pocket is when my left arm separates from the racket. And from here on out, let's focus on the up swing to the contact point. Again, we'll talk about the contact point in detail in a second. I have my contact point out here and then I'm continuing to rotate up and have the tip of the racket pointing up into the sky and ideally the side of the racket with which I hit the ball points to the outside okay so whereas I'm swinging up here my left arm comes down and back and helps me balance All right if I'm just tucking my left arm in or I'm separating too early the whole motion becomes really unbalanced so again this is where the magic happens. Let's look at it from the side one time. So I got my ready hop, I got my turn, and my left hip and left shoulder are pointing way back, not even just straight back, but actually a little bit further over to my right if I were to look straight. All right, so I'm turning. Again, I got my key parts here, racket face over my wrist. My hand is between my hip and my shoulder. And now I'm stepping in. Left hand is still on the racket, separate, contact point, and then I continue to swing. So 
But now let's get into the nitty gritty of the contact point because that's what this whole video is all about. All right, let's talk about the magic contact point. A one-hander obviously does not have the support of the off-hand. So we got to make sure that we keep our contact point in a contact zone. And that zone usually is from hip to shoulder. So you should be able to control your contact in that zone. And you will have different contact points because you will, uh, will get different balls, incoming balls with different height, speed, depth, so on and so forth. Now, my absolute sweet spot is about waist, chest high. So that is in terms of height. In terms of sideways spacing, what I want to accomplish is that I get the contact point in a way that my right wrist, I'm a right-hander, is in front of my right shoulder. It's not too far over here, it's not out here. All right, so I'm making contact when my right wrist is in front of my right shoulder is over my right hip because that way I can swing forward I can still allow for the rotation of my left hip and then lately, uh, lastly my shoulder so again if I'm too far out here I'm reaching I'm gonna be off balance here if I'm too close in here I'm almost developing a side swipe so one thing that I always try to teach my clients is imagine you're shoving something really heavy away how would you do that I would get behind it I'm not pushing anything here or here so I'm getting behind it okay now I can grip my racket that way I get my body weight behind the ball here and I would push this way all right so let's continue with the proper spacing to the side one way that I like to think of it and that's how I was trained was to always use my outside leg as a reference point so ideally what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to get my outside leg behind the ball. It's not gonna be exactly behind the ball. If I were to let the ball go through, it wouldn't hit my leg or my, the left side of my body. But it's a way to just get a reference point here. So what I mean by that is this. I'm turning, I'm moving to the ball, and if I had an incoming ball here, it's not out here, it's not here, I can step in and the ball is fairly close to my outside leg. So that is how I space. And you now also see this a little bit better when I'm making contact here. You can't see my right arm because it's an extension of my shoulder and again over my right hip. So that is the spacing. I'll now show you what to do on court when you get different balls. So we talked about exactly where the contact point needs to be in terms of sideways distance to the body and in terms of reaching out in front. Now, how do I get the same contact point every single time, or at least in my strike zone? It's with my feet, okay? Think of all the great players, Federer with the one-hander, Wawrinka, um, Justine, um, Anna, uh, who else has a one-hander? Me, Micah on tour. Okay, uh, not the best footwork on tour, but not bad. But one thing that I had to learn was really use my footwork to adjust to different balls because you have different balls in terms of depth, height, speed, spin, and width. So you have to adjust with different stances. And we've got our closed stance or neutral or squared stance. I'm using those terms interchangeably because to me, the closed stance is just a variation of the neutral stance. So I try to keep it um, within three terms for my clients. So again, closed, open, and semi-open. So if I have a ball that allows me to move up and step in, I'm going to use my regular closed stance. And that allows me really to transfer my body weight into the ball loading on my left leg. And again, I'm managing, hopefully, to keep that ball in my strike zone. Now, if I'm being pulled out wide, I'm going to either use an open stance or what I prefer, actually, I'm using a so-called, or I call it that, a hinge step. And we'll get into that in a minute. And then lastly, on higher, heavier balls, which hurt a one-hander the most, to my mind, I'm using a semi-open step to adjust to keep that ball in a manageable strike zone. So let's look at all three. All right, now I'm gonna walk you through 
all of the different stances because they are really the key to having a constant contact point. So the first one is the regular old school closed stance, still very applicable, and it's gonna be a ball that's a little shorter and I can step into it. And my friend Faisal is actually gonna help me with that. There we go. All right, so the next one is the wider one-handed backhand. Now, there is an option, of course, to hit an open stance. Many two-handers play it all the time, Djokovic, Serena Williams, everybody, Ash Barty, you have to have that. Now, I personally, when I'm playing now, is I feel I don't necessarily have the strength anymore to really absorb my body weight and then move forward here, push from my left to my right again. So I'm adjusting more these days with a hinge step. Right, so I'm using the right side of my body to just stay rel relatively calm and let the left side of my body hinge around because I want to free up my left hip and my left shoulder. I'm going to show you both. Um, obviously, an open stance requires a lot more strength. So if you're not quite strong enough, maybe the hinge step is a better option for you. So let's get going. All right, so make sure when you're being pulled out wide and you're using either your open stance or your hinge step that you catch your balance here, you absorb the energy here, and you let that come back through and over with your crossover as a recovery step. So I'm coming from out here, either with the front crossover or depending where you are in the court, sometimes even with a back crossover because recovery is the preparation for the next ball. All right, let's talk about high and deep, heavy incoming balls. And that is, to my mind, a huge disadvantage of a one-hander because, again, we don't have the support of our offhand. So that is where really footwork is key, that you're still keeping those balls in a manageable strike zone because being up here above your head is not fun. So you have a few options, and I'll start with the maybe most passive one, but to me the easiest one. And that's what I'm teaching newer players first. So if I'm getting a high, heavy ball that pushes me back, I let myself be pushed back. I'm giving ground. So I'm actually backing up to let that ball come back into my strike zone. And the footwork for that is very similar to a quarterback dropping back in the pocket. So I'm right here, I'm seeing that a high, heavy ball is coming in. I got my split step, I got a drop step, notice that I'm taking my racket back with me already, and then I have a crossover, and from then on, I shuffle if I need more room. And ideally, I let that ball come back down, over the top of its bounce, over the apex, so I can keep it between shoulder and hip. And the ball, after it has bounced and come over apex, it's a little slower. Now, word of caution, of course, you are in an incredibly passive position back here. So my number one goal is to neutralize this ball right back. And I kind of want to do to them what they just did to me. So I'm going high, heavy cross court. Just because you're in a passive court position does not mean that you cannot hit the ball really aggressively. So let's see how I'm doing.
So you'll notice that I'm trying to get good net clearance and I'm trying to keep those balls deep because I want to use that time to not get stuck back here because that of course would open my forehand big time. I want to move forward again to my best spot of recovery and that is happening when I'm hitting the ball a little higher and a little heavier. Now the other option that you have is taking balls on the rise. That's a little bit more advanced to my mind because the ball is faster as it's coming off the bounce, right? But it is one way to not let yourself be pushed all the way back behind the baseline. So and that is where it's really crucial that you have good load off your back leg so that you can transfer a lot of energy into the ball so that you don't just have to muscle it with your arm. Right? The strength or the power of the shot does not come from the arm. It comes from the ground up through your legs, your hips, your torso, so on and so forth. So on the next one, I'm trying to take him on the rise and I'm trying to take time away from my opponent. And again, I'm trying to keep it between hip and shoulder. So let's see how that goes. So when you're taking balls on the rise, make sure that you get up to the ball really quickly. Because if somebody hits higher, heavier topspin, it happens very quickly that they get out of your strike zone. It's a little bit of a riskier shot, but it helps you stay aggressive. Now, one other option you have, and I like that a lot, is using a slice. Because I personally can control my slice pretty well, and that allows me actually to hit an angle off of a higher and deeper ball. So that's just another idea if you want to work on that. So that would be a ball definitely that I would use if I'm playing somebody who has a very aggressive grip because I can carve the ball down and they'll have a harder time getting up again or getting under the ball and up and getting the ball up to my shoulder. So that's what I'm trying to prevent, of course, in the first place that somebody gets the ball up above my shoulder. All right, another ball that can give trouble to one-handers is when people are driving the ball hard and flat through the court. And I think I was just on the cusp of the new generation of players coming in with Capriati, the Williams sisters, uh, Kim Kleisters, Davenport, um, all really, really flat hitters. And I played some of them. And if you try to get under the ball and try to lift it, you most likely shank it. So now think about Angie Kerber. She, to my mind, is the absolute um, best in that. She's sitting against these shots. Right? So you really have to get low to the ball because the ball's not coming up to you and hence it's also not coming up into your strike zone. So you really have to sit low to get with the ball, stay with it, and sometimes the ball is so fast that you don't have time for a wind up. That's when you're just blocking them. All right, so let's give it a whirl. Perfect. All right, so now that we've gone over all eventualities that you can encounter for the most part anyways, let's do five drills that I used to do when I played. So the first one, and you see Faisal there in the background, is one of my favorite warm-up drills. It's battleship cross-court short. So what you're doing is you're just setting up those cones over there, and of course you can do it on the forehand too, but since it's a backhand um, video today, what you're learning there is really to roll over the ball and really shape the ball and use your forearm to pronate here and create rotation and spin on the ball. So that's something that growing up on clay, we had to do more to open the court because you can't really hit through the court and hit winners all day long on clay.
Ah. Oh, that was so close. The second drill is one that's just a tossing drill and that is very specific for your footwork. And I call it a spider drill. I don't know what other names other people have for it, but Faisal will toss the ball, one short ball, then I'll recover back to the middle, one wide ball, recover back to the middle, and then one deeper ball. So I'm working on recovery, but foremost, I'm working on getting my proper stances, again, to keep that ball out in front and in a good strike zone. Okay, the third drill is where Faisal is feeding me two higher, deeper balls to my backhand that I'm trying to roll back heavily and aggressively to basically create a shorter ball that I can then attack with my backhand and go down the line with. And I actually preferred my backhand over my forehand. So that was one of my favorite drills. Ooh, I let that drop a little too much, but that happens. See, that's what you work on. Got to move up a little bit more to keep it in your strike zone. The fourth drill is just a quick drop feed drill. And Faisal is literally just dropping balls right next to me and I'm learning or I'm working on really accelerating quickly with my hand. Um, because that is one thing that you need when you're sitting against these deeper, heavier uh, fastballs that you don't have time for a wind up. It's all in trying to be stable and moving forward with your arms still if you're able to. That is how you work. And then the fifth one is a specialty. It's called the pinch drill. And that is basically we're playing cross court points. So from ad side to ad side, and you have to remain inside the baseline. Meaning you have to work with all kinds of stuff that's coming at you. Could be high balls, could be low balls. You just have to really be creative. And of course, really quick and stable two balls because you're gonna get weird stuff there. You can come in, you can do whatever you want, but you can't get outside the baseline. I hope you enjoyed this video. You can follow me on YouTube, Micah Babble Tennis, or on Instagram at Micah Babble, and I hope to see you soon on either one of those channels.